Morning, everybody. Did everybody have a good spring break? Not really. The weather stunk. I don't know why everybody said they enjoyed it. Every time we have spring break, it's always the worst weather of the spring. I don't know why they schedule it that way. This week would have been a better week for spring break. But nonetheless, the good thing about having bad weather is you didn't have anything to do outside, and so you got to study a lot of organic chemistry. That's cold. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to get into chapter 17, which is talking about carboxylic acids and their derivatives. And we've talked an awful lot about carboxylic acids at various points throughout the semester. So some of this will be like review. You already know some ways to make carboxylic acids. We'll talk about some additional ways to make carboxylic acids. Tell me what you know about carboxylic acids right now. C, what? C-O-O-H, okay. What else do we know? They do have a carbonyl group in them. What else do we know? We can reduce them to LAH to what? To a primary alcohol. That was yours, okay. What else do you know? Are they strong acids or are they weak acids? For an organic molecule, they're quite strong. Compared to the inorganic acids that you all learned about, like HCl, HBr, H2SO4, they're weak, right? Acidity is a relative term, right? So if I compare a normal hydrocarbon to a carboxylic acid, a carboxylic acid is quite strong, okay? But if I compare a carboxylic acid to, say, sulfuric acid, it's rather weak. Where's the rough pKa range for a carboxylic acid? Something like acetic acid. Where would you expect for it to be? For a carboxylic acid, the pKa? 12 is basic, right? pKa, yeah. Where would you expect it to be? Nope. It's acidic. Why would it be at 7? Seven? 7's neutral, right? Where would we expect pK of a carboxylic acid? Somewhere around 4 to 5. Yeah, you're going to expect that, right? And we can change that acidity by putting different substituents on, right? If we destabilize the anion, are we going to make it more basic or more acidic? More basic. And if we stabilize the anion, we're going to make it more acidic, right? So all those things that we learned in Chapter 2 are going to come back to play in this particular chapter. Right, so there are a lot of derivative, derivatives of carboxylic acids that we need to know. You already know them, but we haven't really talked about them a whole lot in terms of being a derivative of a carboxylic acid. We've talked about them as their own functional group. Esters, for example, are a derivative of a carboxylic acid. And you all know this from a lab that you've done, right? Did you all make methyl benzoate already? The synthetic Snapdragon scent lab, right? You took a carboxylic acid and an alcohol and you made an ester. Using whose reaction? What was the name of the reaction? Started with an F. Fischer esterification. There you go. Right. The Fischer esterification reaction, right? And so you were able to take a carboxylic acid and convert it into an ester. And we'll talk about those mechanisms today. Okay. You also need to know that the carbonyl and the R group of a carboxylic acid derivative is called the acyl group. And when you all get into biochemistry, you're going to talk an awful lot about acyl transfer reactions. Okay. They're kind of an important biological process. And uh, they use derivatives of carboxylic acids as the uh, groups that do these acyl transfer reactions. So if we have what looks like a carbonyl and an ether connected together, that's an ester, right? That's not an ether, nor is that just a plain carbonyl. It's one functional group, right? So we have an ester. We can have a nitrogen, right? And so we would have an amide. If R uh, prime here, if both of those are hydrogen, what kind of amide would it be? Primary. If one of the R's was an alkyl group, what would it be? And if they were all? Tertiary, right? So we can have primary, secondary, 
and tertiary amides. Very important functional groups. If you've ever used nylon, nylon is a polyamide. Okay? It is a very useful material. The amide functional group is stronger or weaker than an ester functional group? Weaker? It's stronger, right? Think about it. We are not polyester based. We are polyamide based. And there's a reason for that. We are biological derivatives of nylon, if you want to think of it that way. Our um, proteins are held together by amide bonds, not ester bonds, right? Because esters will hydrolyze fairly readily, whereas amides do not. The amide functional group, this bond is actually quite a bit stronger than the ester bond, okay? And hydrides, okay? There are carboxylic acid derivatives called anhydrides. Why do we call these anhydrides? What does the name anhydride mean? Hydrogen has something to do with it. Dry? Okay. Along the way. Huh? If I look at an anhydride, what does it kind of look like? Kind of looks like a double ester sharing a single oxygen, right? Okay. So really it's taking two carboxylic acids and bringing them together. Minus what? A hydrogen? Two hydrogens and what? And an oxygen. Anhydride means minus water, right? So really, an anhydride is what happens when you take a carboxylic acid and you heat it really hot and you drive the water off, you get an anhydride, okay? And that's how they originally made things like acetic anhydride or uh, these other types of anhydrides, the cyclic anhydrides, for example. Phthalic anhydride is the name of this one, okay? These are reactive intermediates. They react with nucleophiles. Uh, one of the acyl groups will function as a leaving group, and the other one can uh, 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 effectively function as an electrophile. And so uh, a lot of the things that you can use acid chlorides for, you can substitute anhydrides, and they're a lot easier to work with. Okay? So we can have a symmetrical anhydride. Where is it symmetrical? Where's the symmetry? At the center oxygen, what kind of symmetry is it? There's a plane of symmetry. That's right. There's a mirror plane, right? It's not a point. It's a plane of symmetry, right? So we could have, if the two carboxylic acids that come together to make this are identical, you make what are known as symmetrical anhydrides. Here, if we look at the plane, is there a plane of symmetry? No. And so we call this a mixed anhydride because it actually took two different carboxylic acids, if you will, to make this. It took acetic acid and it took benzoic acid to come together to make this mixed anhydride. This is a cyclic anhydride, and cyclic anhydrides can or cannot or may or may not be symmetrical. How about this one? That is a symmetrical anhydride. Okay, so it is a symmetrical cyclic anhydride called phthalic anhydride. Uh, there are, uh, we, as we talked about, several different types of amides. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary amides. What's the type of amide that holds your proteins together? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? For the most part, it's secondary. That's right. Secondary amides are what link all of your amino acids together into a polyamide that makes the various proteins in your muscles, your heart, your all the all the kinds of stuff, right? So secondary amides are... Uh, by and large what are responsible for that. Tertiary amides also come into play in some of your proteins because you have this amino acid that we'll talk about later called proline, which actually forms tertiary amide bonds. Uh, there are cyclic esters and amides, but we don't call them cyclic esters and amides. We call them lactones and lactams. Okay, so a lactone is nothing more than a cyclic ester. Okay. So if we look at this, we have this so-called gamma lactone because when you look at the ester functional group, you notice that there's a one, two, three carbons that are connecting it all together. And so they call this the alpha carbon, the beta carbon, and the gamma carbon. So these are what are known as gamma lactones. What do you suppose the chemistry of these things are going to be like? Just like esters. They will reduce with lithium aluminum hydride to give us two alcohols. Okay. 
We can add Grignards to them to make tertiary alcohols and a primary alcohol. Uh, we can do all that kind of stuff. It just so happens that the OR and the carbonyl are all connected together. That's the only difference. Here we have a delta lactone because, again, we've got more carbon, so you make this six-membered ring. Here we have the cyclic uh, amides that are called lactams. This is a beta-lactam. This is a gamma-lactam. The beta-lactams are very, very important in medicine. Can anybody tell me why? No. Why are the beta-lactams so important in medicine? Anybody ever heard of penicillin? Penicillin is a beta-lactam. It's an antibiotic. Beta-lactams are actually very potent antibiotics. Okay, So we'll talk a little bit about that in this chapter as well, the beta-lactam antibiotics. Does anybody know anything about penicillin these days? When I was a kid, you got sick. No matter what you got sick with, you got a shot of penicillin. They don't do that so much anymore. Anybody know why? bacterial resistance and it actually turns out that the penicillin antibiotics are among the most uh, they're the, among the strongest antibiotics that we know we don't want to build up resistance to them and we started doing that back in the 70s and 80s people were take over prescribing uh, beta lactams and people were bad about taking their medicine completely and so you started getting uh, bacterial resistant uh, strains or antibiotic resistant strains excuse me of bacteria and so uh, penicillin is not given like it used to be. I mean, if I went to the doctor when I was a kid, you almost always left with a bill of penicillin. I mean, it was just kind of the thing that they did back, in, back then. Nitriles are a carboxylic acid derivative. Can anybody tell me why? Does that look like a carboxylic acid? It doesn't, does it? The carbon of the nitrile is what hybridization? It is SP. What is the hybridization of a carbon and a carboxylic acid? SP2. So why is it that we would put nitriles and carboxylic acids in the, in the same category? You can, in fact. We can make nitriles from carboxylic acids. But why would I place this into the, what's the underlying reason? And this kind of hints at it, but it doesn't really say, say it out loud. What do you know about the oxidation state of this carbon? And the oxidation state of a carboxylic acid carbon? They're the same. So they have the same oxidation state at the carbon, and so they place them in the same uh, category, okay? So we know that carboxylic acids behave like acids. Surprise, surprise, that's their name, right? We know that we can take a carboxylic acid and we can deprotonate it by treating it with some dilute base, something like sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydroxide or some mild base will deprotonate and form a carboxylate salt, right? Uh, and you all did an experiment back in 255 in the lab where you separated a acidic component from a neutral component using this technique. What tool did you use to do that? What piece of glassware did you use? You used a separatory funnel, right? And you put your dirty mixture in, if you will, that had, I forget what the neutral is, it doesn't really matter, maybe it was naphthalene or something, and then you had a carboxylic acid you put that in the separatory funnel, you added some organic solvent, ether, methylene chloride, whatever it was, right? And then you added base, and what happens? They do separate, but what happens to the mixture? The neutral goes where? Goes through. But what layer does it end up in? You gotta know which layer it goes into, right? What layer does it go into? The neutral? So if we had naphthalene, would that go into an aqueous layer? No. So that'd go into the organic layer. What happened to the carboxylic acid? Why did it go into the aqueous layer? Are all carboxylic acids soluble? No. 
but when it forms the salt, they become more water soluble, right? And so when you reacted it with the base, it formed a carboxylate salt, making it more water soluble, allowing you to separate the two components. You took the organic layer and you set it aside, right? And you took the water layer, and then what'd you do to the water layer? Well, you might have done that, but what did you do at the end to get your acid back? Remember, you added something and the acid precipitated out of solution. It was soluble in water under basic conditions, so what would we add to the water? You'd add acid, right? And you would reverse the process, right? So we would reverse it and we'd get the carboxylic acid. It had enough carbons that it was no longer soluble in water, right? And it, it, it you know, uh, precipitated out and you all uh, isolated it. So, you know, I can't remember. Your carboxylic acid probably had six or seven carbons. And so it was water insoluble because it didn't satisfy the uh, five carbon rule, right? But when you make something into a salt, the five carbon rule goes out the window. And salts, as you know, are more soluble in water than neutral species, right? And so all of a sudden now you can get things that have six, seven, eight carbons into water if they're a salt. And so you were able to get it into uh, water, separate it from the neutral, and then you took this and you reacidified it. It fell out of the water and you isolated it by filtration. So these are some ways in which you can separate carboxylic acids from other organic compounds. And if you ever get interested in medicinal chemistry where they actually go out and get plants and small animals and things to look for medicines, they actually do a lot of these different separations where they will take separatory funnels and separate the basic components from the acidic components from the neutral components. And that's usually the first thing that they do when they're looking for new molecules that may have medicinal value. So it's, it's uh, very important to understand uh, how uh, acidity can, can be uh, utilized to your benefit to separate things. Okay? We know that anything that stabilizes the anion favors the dissociation. And if we favor the dissociation, is that a stronger acid or a weaker acid? It's a stronger acid, right? By definition, strong acids completely dissociate, right? So anything that can favor this side of the uh, equilibrium is going to make this a stronger acid, okay? And so there are electronic influences that come into play here, right? If we have a group on the, and G's just a generic group here, okay? If we have a group on the carboxylate of the carboxylic acid, so we're looking at the anion, we always look at the anion, and that group can withdraw electrons. Let's say it's electronegative. Is that going to stabilize the anion or destabilize the anion? It's going to stabilize it, right? And so it's going to make it a stronger acid. If I have something in that group that donates electrons, then that's going to destabilize the carboxylate and make it a stronger or weaker acid? A weaker acid. And so we can play with acidity by putting different electron withdrawing or electron donating groups on our molecules. Okay, so for example, if you look at uh, acetic acid, it has a pK of about 4.76 or less, right? 4.75, depending on which book you look at. Um, it's a fairly weak acid, right? It's about where you expect it. You'll take this, you'll mix it with olive oil, and you'll make your dressing out of it, right? This is how you make Italian dressing, oil and vinegar. Okay, now if we replace one of the hydrogens on this uh, methyl group with a chlorine, notice what happens to the pKa. It drastically goes down, right? That doesn't seem like a lot when you're just subtracting the two numbers, but remember, it's magnitude, right? So this is, this is huge, just by replacing a hydrogen with a chlorine. We replace one of these hydrogens with another chlorine, we're down to 1.48. We replace the last hydrogen with a chlorine, and now we have trichloroacetic acid. We have a pK of 0.7. So this we would call a weak acid. This is starting to get into the ballpark of strong acids, right? What's the name of this effect? It is the inductive effect. Why is it not the element effect? The element effect deals with the element bearing the negative charge in the, in the anion, that's right. 
And in this case, when we look at them, we would remove the hydrogen, right? And we would be looking at the carboxylate. We haven't changed the element there, right? They're all oxygens. So this is all inductive. These chlorines never take on a formal negative charge, right? It all has to do with the fact that chlorine's electron withdrawing because it's electronegative. And so as they're pulling electrons to themselves, what happens to this carbon? It becomes more positive, partially positive. And putting a partial positive next to something that's negatively charged stabilizes or destabilizes? It stabilizes, right? And so we see this. And this is not a small effect. What would you predict if we, instead of using chlorine, we used fluorine? It'd even be a much larger effect. And in fact, trifluoroacetic acid is a strong acid. It's a nasty acid, actually. If you've ever opened a bottle of trifluoroacetic acid, TFA as they call it in, bio, in, uh, in uh, biochem, I mean, it starts fuming. It's a pretty strong acid, and it's got a pretty pungent odor to it as well. We also know that where we place the halogens matters quite a bit, right? So here we've got uh, the same acid. We're just shifting the position of the chlorine. So if we have a single chlorine atom on the alpha carbon, we get about 2.85, which is kind of what we would expect, right, from what we saw up here. But notice if we move it from the alpha to the beta, all of a sudden we get to pretty close to being unsubstituted, right? And then when we move it out even further. So why, why is that? That's exactly right. So charge separation, right, doesn't stabilize as much, right? So uh, this so-called uh, inductive effect falls off very dramatically with distance, right? The best that you're going to get is when you have that right on that alpha carbon, okay? So we can have a long carbon chain. We can put some halogens way out there, and it's not really going to affect the acidity very much. We want those halogens to be as close as possible to the carboxylate. Benzoic acids also experience the same type of, of, uh, of uh, effect on pKa by the type of group that we have. So if we look at benzoic acid, benzoic acid has a pKa of about 4.19. Can anybody tell me why this has a lower pKa than acetic acid? Why is that anion more stable? Resonance? Can I, can I resonance delocalize the negative charge any more than I can with acetic acid? No, it's still in the carboxylate, right? But the aromatic ring is in conjugation with the carbonyl. That does lower, uh, lower the pK just a little bit, but just a little bit, right? Not even a full unit. So there's where benzoic acid is. You all are familiar with the sodium salt of benzoic acid, a sodium benzoate, if you like uh, soy sauce. Uh, it's usually added as a preservative to uh, soy sauce. So next time you're in the Chinese restaurant, take the Kikomans and turn it over and look. It'll say preserved with sodium benzoate. Uh, it's a pretty good preservative. Now, if we add some groups to the benzene ring, here we're adding a chlorine. Notice what's happening to the pKa. It's going down, right? So we're becoming a stronger and stronger acid. The nitro group, even, even better, right? 3.4 in terms of pKa. Notice what happens when we add a methyl group. Methyl groups are electron releasing, right? pKa goes up. How do I know that a methyl group is electron releasing? Where have we studied that before, where we've been talking about Yeah, when we talked about directing effects on friedel crafts chemistry, right? We learned that things like nitro was a meta director, right? So it's electron withdrawing, right? Chlorine was an ortho pair director, but it was a that was ortho pair directing, but it was deactivating. Remember that the halogens are the special class because they have lone pairs of electrons, so they do direct ortho para but they deactivate the system because they're so electronegative. So really, these electron withdrawing groups are going to be deactivating groups that you learned about in, uh, in the chapter where we talked about friedel crafts acylation and, and uh, alkylation. And the ortho-pair directing groups that we're activating 
are going to be your electron releasing groups. Things like alcohols, ethers, uh, alkyl groups, those are all going to be electron releasing and make the acid less, uh, less acidic. Okay. We've talked about a variety of ways to make carboxylic acids from 255 all the way till now. So a lot of this is um, just rehash, if you will. Right? We've talked about taking alkenes and cutting them in half using either ozone or potassium permanganate to give us carboxylic acids. Now, notice the potassium permanganate. Remember when we talked about making the syndiols with potassium permanganate? I told you you had to be very careful. And the potassium permanganate reaction had to be kept what? Cold. Right. So if you, if you take potassium permanganate and an alkene and you keep it cold, and you do the reaction very carefully, you'll get a syndiol. But if you heat it up, you actually get two carboxylic acids, where it cuts the alkene in half. Okay, And this becomes one carbonyl carbon. This becomes the other carbonyl carbon. We can also do ozonolysis under um, uh, oxidative conditions, where we have hydrogen peroxide, where we can cut the carbon-carbon double bond into two carboxylic acids. We can also cut the carbon-carbon double bond into two aldehydes if we use reducing conditions here, right? So like zinc and water or the dimethyl sulfide that we talked about. We also talked about the ability to take primary alcohols and oxidize them to carboxylic acids using Jones reagents. Potassium permanganate will also do this. You can oxidize primary alcohols to carboxylic acids, okay? And we also talked about oxidizing aldehydes to carboxylic acids, right, using, what was the name of this reagent that we talked about last chapter? The little test that I did for you all. Tollens. Yeah, that's the Tollens reagent. And so the Tollens reagent's very good about taking aldehydes and oxidizing them to carboxylic acids. Now, we did that on a sugar because the sugar was in equilibrium with its aldehyde form, right, and so we were able to oxidize it and get the carboxylic acid of that sugar and the silver precipitates out and makes a nice pretty flask, right? How would I go from here to here? From the primary alcohol to the aldehyde. PCC, how would I go from the aldehyde to the primary alcohol? LAH will work or sodium borohydride. And if you had to choose, and why? It's a lot easier to deal with, that's right. Lithium aluminum hydride, if I gave that to each and every one of you, somebody would get hurt, okay? Uh, sodium borohydride, I could give that to you all and nobody will get hurt, okay? So it's just a nice reagent to use when you, when you can, okay? This was the example that we used for the Tollens test last time where we made the uh, silver flask, which is sitting down in my office waiting for somebody to win, right? And I will make as many of those as I need to for the next test that's coming up in one week, right? So I want, make me have to go and buy bunches of flasks, okay? I want to make bunches of them, okay? But what we did, right, was we took an aldehyde and we oxidized it to a carboxylic acid. And the nice thing about the Tollens reagent is that it's very, very selective for aldehydes. It leaves other things alone. It will not oxidize a primary alcohol, for example to a carboxylic acid or an aldehyde. Whereas PCC will do that, right? Or Jones reagent will do that. The Tollens reagent really only deals with the, um, with the uh, aldehyde. And we, and we know that from the experiment that we did. Look at all the alcohols that are in a sugar. And the only thing that we really oxidized was the aldehyde. And so we had the hemiacetal form of the sugar, which is what you probably learn most of in biology and your biochemistry, okay? So uh, this carbon right here is the carbonyl carbon, and this is in equilibrium. So this can form the aldehyde, and there's, uh, there's your alcohol right there, right? Um, these are known as reducing sugars because they will reduce silver plus to silver metal, okay? And you'll learn an awful lot about reducing sugars in your upper level biology and biochemistry classes. They're kind of an important class of sugars, okay? So this is the hemiacetal form. This is so-called open form. What would happen if we took this sugar 
and we reacted it with a vitigree agent, what do you think would happen? Think anything would happen? That's right. Vitigree reagents will also react with sugars if they're reducing sugars because they're in equilibrium with their open form, okay? Because you have a carbonyl. Okay. So let's look at some um, other syntheses. So here we're going to look at the synthesis of pentanoic acid. Pentanoic acid means what? What's that name mean? Five. Yeah, we're talking about five carbons, right? And so if you look at pentanoic acid, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons, including the carbonyl carbon. You always have to remember that. In the naming, the carbonyl carbon is counted in the name, okay? A lot of people get that confused, and they'll put the carboxylic acid, and they'll go, I need to add five carbons to it. That would give you six carbons. That would be hexanoic acid, okay? In the name, the penta includes the carbonyl carbon of the carboxylic acid. It's also known as valeric acid, and this stuff stinks to high heaven. Okay, it's not a very pleasant thing to make, and so you can actually know um, that you're making it by the odor that you that you generate. So if uh, Obrey came into the lab and he needed a bunch of pentanoic acid, and being the cheap person that I am, I said, well, just make it instead of buying it. We have a lot of one bromobutane. Right? One bromobutane has four carbons, and he knows now that we need a, a fifth carbon in there. He would take this and react it with uh, sodium cyanide. Sodium cyanide will do what type of reaction to give me the nitrile? That's an SN2 reaction, right? I've got a primary alkyl halide. Bromide is a good or bad leaving group? It's quite good, right? Cyanide, good or bad nucleophile? Good. So I've got a really good nucleophile. I've got a really good leaving group. It's a primary alkyl halide. All those things come into play to tell me it's going to be an SN2 reaction, right? The cyanide will displace the bromide. We end up with pentane nitrile. And we know that the carbon of the nitrile is in the exact same oxidation state as the carbon of the pentanoic acid. The only thing we have to do, right, is get rid of the nitrogen and replace it with oxygen. And the way that you do this is you simply hydrolyze it, okay? And so what you do is you take the nitrile, and you boil it up in sodium hydroxide for a while, about 24 hours, and that will get rid of the nitrogen, and you'll end up with a carboxylate salt, which then you just acidify with something like dilute sulfuric acid, and that'll get you to the pentanoic acid or the valeric acid pretty in a fairly straightforward manner. Now, I say this as if this part right here is extremely easy. It is on paper. My group has tried to do these reactions multiple times, and rarely does it work this easily. The nitrile is actually quite stable, and it turns out that sometimes you can get it to work if the moon's aligned right, and sometimes you just can't seem to get it to work hardly at all, okay? So in theory, on paper, this works, and it does work, but it's finicky for whatever reason that I'm not quite sure about, but it can, it can cause you a lot, of, a lot of headaches. How else might we go from one bromobutane to pentanoic acid if I go, Obri, I'm not going to trust you with sodium cyanide? What could he do? Pardon? Grignard. Grignard. How would we do that with a Grignard? So we've got the one bromobutane. We need to get the pentanoic acid. How would we do it? Grignard's not a bad idea. How, how would we do it? React this with magnesium, okay, and that would make the Grignard. And then what would the other step be? So we've got this Grignard. There's four carbons, right? Ah. One, two, three, four. Yep, there we go. So, right, I could take that, I could react it with carbon dioxide, right, and then quench it with dilute acid. That would work, okay? Now, Obrey mentioned something. He said maybe use some kind of carbonyl. What kind of carbonyl could we use? Let's say we're out of dry ice, we don't have any carbon dioxide. What else could we do? 
what would it be? Ah, formaldehyde followed by what? Mm -mm. If I do this Grignard with formaldehyde, what do I get? Grignards plus aldehyde give me what? Primary alcohols, right? So I would get a primary alcohol from this. So then what would I do to take it to the carboxylic acid? Jones reagent, right. So there are more than one way to get there. I could go the nitrile route. I could go the carbon dioxide route. Or I could go the formaldehyde route. There are more than one way to get to these products, okay? A lot of what we've been talking about for a semester and a half you, I mean, you've already got everything. Now it's just figuring out how to mix and match it together to get the products that we want. There's always more than one way to get to a functional group these days. Okay? It's never just A plus B gives C. A plus B gives C. A plus B gives C. A plus E gives C sometimes. Okay? And so uh, being able to mix and match your different reactions is kind of getting to be more and more important here. Okay? So for example, um, we just talked about the Grignard chemistry, right? So here's an example of that where you take the tert butyl chloride, magnesium and ether, you make the magnesium uh, or the Grignard reagent, excuse me, right? Carbon dioxide followed by uh, aqueous acid and you get the uh, carboxylic acid pretty straightforward. This also works very well, of course, for um, aromatic halides. So here we have uh, this uh, trimethyl bromobenzene, we've converted it into the Grignard reagent, and we could get uh, the carboxylic acid uh, quite easily. Okay. One of the nice things about um, carboxylic acid derivatives is that the carbonyl carbon can function as an electrophile. So carboxylic acids can be acidic, obviously, but their derivatives can actually be electrophiles where nucleophiles can attack them. And so we learned about this with Grignard, or excuse me, with um, uh, ketones and aldehydes where uh, let's say the nucleophile could be a Grignard reagent, right? So if I have a nucleophile adding to the carbonyl carbon of let's say a ketone, I get an alcohol, right? So we learned that ketones plus Grignards give tertiary alcohols. We learned that uh, aldehydes plus Grignards give secondary alcohols, right? We learned that last time. And so it's a very simple mechanism where the nucleophile attacks, breaks the weak pi bond. You end up at the tetrahedral intermediate, which is an alkoxide. And then um, this gets protonated either through workup or, or some other mechanism, and you end up with an alcohol. Things are different with carboxylic acid derivatives, though, because we have an electronegative atom on the carbonyl. Here we just had carbons or hydrogens. Here we have now some type of potential leaving group. So let's suppose this is a OR from an ester. What can happen is, is that the nucleophile can attack. You get a tetrahedral intermediate, and now this comes back and kicks out a leaving group, and you can end up forming a new carbonyl. Okay? These are known as acyl transfer reactions, and again, very important biological processes. This is how your body tags certain things for elimination, for example. It will put an acyl group on them. And then you, the machinery of your body knows to process that a certain way. Okay? And again, you'll learn more about that in terms of uh, biochemistry when you get there. Okay? This is called an addition elimination mechanism. Why do we call it an addition elimination? Because the first step is the addition of the nucleophile to the carbon. right? followed by the elimination of whatever X happens to be, okay? So, from the viewpoint of uh, an organic chemist, it turns out that alkyl, or excuse me, that um, acid chlorides are very good at this acyl transfer uh, process. So, for example, if we took an acid chloride and some nucleophile, we will replace the chlorine with that nucleophile, okay? And since the nucleophile has a hydrogen on it, it ends up generating HCl as a byproduct, which th we, then we have to deal with. And usually we use something like pyridine 
to react with the acid to, to keep it from boiling out of our flask. Okay? These reactions are quite vigorous. They're quite exothermic. If you're not careful, they can blow up on you just because they heat up so quickly and they'll just boil all the solvent out. So usually these have to be run at very low temperature. Acid chlorides are very, very reactive. And this chemistry is very, very good. I could give every one of you one of these reactions to do and none of you would mess it up. I promise. Nylon is the easiest polymer in the world to make. You mix an acid chloride and an amine together and you get this polyamide. You can pull it out with a with a, a, a pair of forceps and make these long little strings of, of uh, nylon. It's real easy to do. We used to have kids do it all the time. Uh, very, very easy reaction. So let's look at some uh, of these reactions um, with the acid chloride. So for example, if I take an acid chloride and I react it with a carboxylate anion, I get an anhydride. Okay. Help me with the mechanism. So I've got an acid chloride, and I've got a carboxylate. Help me push the arrows. What happened? Oxygen to carbon. Which oxygen? Now what happens? Does it kick off the chlorine directly? No, the pi bond All right, we're going to break the weak pi bond first, right? Now what happens? And chlorine leaves. Addition, elimination. Biochemists call it acyl transfer. Same thing, right? So if I take an acid chloride and I react it with water, what do you think the mechanism is going to be? Not kind of, exactly the same. The only difference is, is the nucleophile is now water, right? So water adds, it eliminates. You get HCl and you form a carboxylic acid. Pretty straightforward. If we take an acid chloride and an alcohol, what do I get? What's the functional group? An ester. That's exactly right. Is that what you all did when you did the esterification reaction? Did you all use an acid chloride? You remember? You did not. You used the Fischer esterification. So you took the carboxylic acid itself, the alcohol, and sulfuric acid and did the reaction. It's a different mechanism, okay? but you get to the same product. Acid chlorides, we don't have you all work with acid chlorides too much because they like to fume and put out HCl gas and everybody would be in there choking. Not a very good idea. Okay? So we had a lot easier reaction. So what's the take home message here? Take home message here is that acid chlorides can make a lot of different functional groups. If I take an acid chloride and I react it with an amine, what am I going to get? An amide. If I take an acid chloride and I react it with a carboxylate, I get an anhydride. If I take an acid chloride and I react it with a water, I get an acid. If I take an acid chloride and I react it with an alcohol, I get an ester. Acid chlorides are very, very useful reagents. So for example, here we took an acid chloride, reacted it with ammonia, and we got a primary amide. Here we took an acid chloride and we reacted it with a primary amine and we got a secondary amide. Here we took an acid chloride and we reacted it with a secondary amine and we got a tertiary amide. We can make all kinds of amides all day long, very, very easily. Notice, however, we have to add excess amine, at least to equivalents, because HCl gets generated, right? What does HCl do when it comes into contact with an amine? It neutralizes, right? So you have to have a sacrificial amine. One of these gets sacrificed to give you an ammonium salt, okay? So you always have to have the amine in excess to do this. But nonetheless, it works very, very well.
getting into mosquito season, right? Many of you will be spraying stuff all over you as you go out to keep from getting West Nile virus, right? Which is a good thing. Those products contain what's called DEET. DEET is made using nothing more than sophomore level organic chemistry. SC Johnson and Company just packages it in a nice fancy bottle that sprays and charges you a lot for it, okay? And it works really well. But they simply take this acid chloride and they take diethylamine, they use an excess of it, at least two equivalents, they mix these things together and they get DEET, which is nothing more than this tertiary amide. It is a mosquito repellent, okay? It's extremely easy to make. They literally have a, a bucket of this, basically two buckets of that. They mix them together and they get their DEET. They take that, they wash it to get rid of the ammonium salt. They take this, they put it in a can, pressurize it, put other stuff in there to help spray it properly, and voila, you've got, you've got DEET, okay? How many of you use DEET products? Yeah, right? I mean, it's a very effective uh, mosquito repellent. Pardon? But very easy to make. All of you can make your own if you wanted to. Okay. So here's a mechanism for the formation of uh, anhydrides. This is nothing more than an additional elimination that we just talked about, right? So which one of these is functioning as the uh, acid and which one's functioning as the base? The carboxylate? That is the Lewis base because it's the electron pair donor. It's the negatively charged one, right? What's acting as the acid here? The chlorine, the carbon, or the oxygen? The carbon. It's accepting the electron pair, right? So we have the Lewis base attacking the Lewis acid. We end up at the tetrahedral intermediate. This then falls apart through the elimination mechanism, and you end up with an anhydride, right? Nice, uh, nice little reaction mechanism. Water, same way. Water attacks, it's the nucleophile, so here it's functioning as the Lewis base. You end up with the tetrahedral intermediate. Turns out that this oxygen, of course, now being positively charged is quite acidic, so it loses the proton, but uh, through the reaction with the base, and you end up eliminating the chloride, and you end up with the carboxylic acid at the end. Okay. So we don't have a whole lot of time. I want you to copy this down. There is no one right answer to this problem, but you have to start from this alkene and you have to get to this ester. Use anything you want. Put it on a three by five note card and bring it back on Wednesday and I'll give a couple of bonus points if you get it right, okay? So you can work together, whatever you need to do. On your way out, please leave your inverted lectures up here at the top or at the front, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>